Hello and welcome to I Miss Book Club. I'm Veronica Reynolds and today I have a brand new co-host, Amelia Neymark. She's a local author and she has published many short stories and more recently she's published two novels, Hide in Place and Behind the Lie, both of which have been very well received both by Publishers Weekly and Kirkus. And if you haven't heard of Kirkus, it is the librarian's gold standard for reviews, so we love to see it. Um, and also, one of the books was shortlisted for a very prestigious award, the Silver Falchion Award in 2022. So welcome, Amelia. It's so nice to see you. How are you today? Great. Thank you for having me. This is very exciting. I love libraries. <laughs> oh, thanks. And it's our pleasure to have Amelia here. Um, she led a panel of mystery writers last year. And if you're enjoying today's conversation, you may want to come back for our Zoom on September 29th at 7 p.m. Amelia will be joined by a few other authors to talk about thrillers, which I'm personally very excited about. I love thrillers. Um, so I have to ask you our introductory question, which I ask all our co-hosts, Amelia. What is a book that made you? Um, so I was thinking about this question, and I realized that it's a, it's a different answer depending on the you know, decade of my life. But I guess in terms of writing and becoming a writer, the answer is Twilight. <laughs> because apparently, and not just in my case, but apparently a lot of women who read Twilight became authors. Hmm. Like that book and Stephanie Meyer, uh, she launched like a thousand billion women into the writing universe and I'm not even sure why or how or it's not like you know her it's not like we all read her stuff and said oh I could do this because it's very well written it's very compelling and obviously absorbed a lot of people of different ages but something about it really inspired uh, a whole crap ton of women to start to start writing and me among them and uh, at one point I was uh, having this discussion with a with another author and and she said oh yeah I started writing after I I, became, I like fell down this rabbit hole after I you know read Twilight and, and she's like and I know so many other people who just started right around that time so I mean absolutely 50 shades of gray which probably was one of the few series to rival it in popularity started out as twilight fan fiction. I mean, it's pretty inarguably made an enormous impression no matter how else anyone felt about it. Yeah. Um, it changed the course of YA literature very strongly for a long it time. Did. Even just minorly um, cover art was different for years after those hands, white hands holding a red object became like such a big piece of cover art. You saw it on everything. Absolutely. I, I think it just spawned so many things. Um, it, I think it even spawned Muse's uh, musical career. You know, the band Muse, because oh yeah, the author sure. was just so such a fan that she promoted them, and, and all of a sudden, like they might have exploded anyway. But I think her, the popularity of her of her books had a lot to do with how big they certainly had. all the actors who were in the movies became yeah. extraordinarily popular as well. Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart really made their lives. Very different. They both had acting yeah. careers before that, but nothing like that. So it's yeah. not be, the uh, the impact cannot be underestimated. I think in general, there's a desire to minimize things that teen girls are interested in. You know, there, but the, but you know what the books, the books were. You know how you said no matter how what you feel about them, and I think there's a certain attitude towards well, it's romance, it's paranormal, it's like YA, but there's they were really well written and compelling and they were just, you know, cause I won't read anything if it's badly written. If it starts out with a stupid sentence, I'm just going to put it inside because, you know, life is too short, but right. I, I inhaled all of those. And I just think that, uh, you know, something, something about, and, and I don't know what it is, but, that's that was that was my my turn. I think she place. really hit a chord. I mean, I think I think Stephanie Meyer should not be underrated for really changing the course of a lot of people's lives by literature. I mean, tremendous impact. Absolutely. And we all wish, I'm sure, as writers, that we had impact on the world. Wouldn't that be nice? That's no, it's amazing. And, and, and I think that you know, I I then started reading about her and the fact that she wrote it while having tiny children i just thought she can do it 
you know, with tiny <laughs> kids. I, I can do it with like a fourth grader, you know, at the time. So. It's very inspiring. It makes me think of, um, I don't know, you might, maybe you have read her because she's certainly a founding woman of, of horror and thrillers, but Shirley Jackson. Oh, of course. You know, had very small children when she yeah. started writing. And I really wrote like kind of in between being a lot of full-time things to her family. <laughs> I think about I, her all the time. I think it, it might have been Shirley Jackson when I, I read about how how she writes because, you know, people are asked, you know, do you outline, you know, how many drafts do you go through? And I think it was her who said that she kind of thinks about it and thinks about it and thinks about it. And by the time she writes it down, it's like pretty much it's done. And then it just needs like some line editing, you know, and the, which is pretty amazing. That's unbelievable. So I think, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I wonder too, and maybe you have a thought on this because you talk to a lot of other writers, I think because writers are asked about their process a lot. I wonder if you feel compelled to elaborate a process that might be more simple because it doesn't sound exciting enough. I don't know. So I think like sometimes some people do just sit down, write, what's in their heads. I don't know that everybody has like an elaborate outline process all the time, you know? You know, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe some, I think it's actually probably depends on the person more than the definition of being a writer. I think yeah. most people I know are pretty honest about their process. I think you know, because I don't mean to accuse people of lying. It probably sounded badly, yeah. but you know what I mean? I think because you're put on the spot, sometimes people have to kind of come up know. with a, yeah. something. I don't know. There was another another author, of a female author from the mid, mid-century, and I wish I could remember her name, but she said that the best way that she came up with all of her uh, stories was like she would just do housework. If I was in a in a spot, I would wash the floors. By the time I was done washing the floors, I I had like it written in my head, and I sat down and wrote it. So obviously, that's <laughs> I deep, love that because you have to read right now. But <laughs> um, not everybody has the time to sit down and like outline. You know, I think a lot of people do the stuff in their head. So as a mystery author, I imagine you must outline to some extent, right? Because of Oh, I do. I, my first my first when I first started writing, I simply had no idea at all, at all, at all how to how to assemble a story and I just thought like at, at, with every chapter that I started, I was like how do I do this? How do, and I just kept like searching and searching and searching and I was like there were all all these different you know, there's books, there's blog posts, there's all this stuff about how to outline, how to structure. And sometimes you just fall down this this hole where, you know, it's like a, like, I don't, I couldn't even understand the words I was reading, yeah. you know, in terms of how to put together an outline. And I thought, none of this resonates, none of this makes sense, and I don't know, and I still don't know how to do that. So my first novel that I wrote that I queried was actually Paranormal Romance. Awesome. <laughs> because, Love it. Because it, it was inspired, in general, it was inspired by, by Stephanie Meyer. Um, and, and it was based on the Orpheus myth, of course. Because, Lovely. Love that. Yeah, why not? Um, but, and it, 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 it wasn't bad in parts, but as a whole, it was a hot mess because I didn't know how to pull it all together. Um, by the time I wrote my second one, I, I understood the concept more, but I was, I think I was using an outline that didn't work well with how I thought. And that was the save the cat outline method, which, you know, some of your, um, listeners might be familiar with, but it, I, I found that it didn't work very well for fiction. It's, mm. it's meant, it's meant for films. Mm. Um, and then I, I kind of stumbled upon this outline by uh, a thriller writer, apparently a fairly prolific thriller writer who's, you know, with the same publisher that I'm with, but it, before I was with this publisher. And, and that outline really made so much sense to me. And as soon as I found it, I wrote 
the book that turned into Hide in Place. And I wrote it pretty fast. And it was just made, made all kinds of sense to do. It's worth noting that your books came out within a year of each other, which I was incredibly impressed by when I was looking at it, because it actually took me a second to figure out which one came first, one in 2021 and then one in 2022. Did you write them that quickly? So the first one took about a year to write. And then when I started, by the time I got my agent, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start writing the second one. And it, if it, and I was writing it in a way that it could have been a standalone if mm-hmm. I didn't sell the first one and I could have just started selling the second one or it could have been a, a sequel. And uh, when my publisher, you know, gave me the offer, they actually gave me the offer for two books and they said, is it this year? I said, yes, of course. <laughs> and so, and so then what happened is I had basically two drafts of it as a series and, and a draft as a standalone. And I, I used kind of the William Burroughs cut up method and I cut, wrote up each chapter as a line and I cut them up and then I glued them together. And I had this outline that if I stood up and held it up, the outline was like slightly taller than I was. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love that. And then as I was, then, then I was like in my second or third draft of the book by then, because of so much of it was already written. And then I would just like, and, and I had it rolled up like a scroll. So mm-hmm. then like when I would get to a certain chapter, I'd like unroll the scroll and look at my app. I'm like, All right, that's the part I'm writing now. I absolutely love that. What a visual. I love having a scroll yeah. of your book. That feels just, it's so lovely. Um, and so I thought one of the things we could talk about today and you and I did talk about in the yeah. run up was just the process of publication. So you got an agent. How'd that go? How did yeah. finding an agent even work in this day and age? In this day and age. Uh, I, I don't know. I kind of think I, I have a guardian angel. Hmm. I, I think that I firmly believe that if you want something and you direct your energies towards that, you will get that. You know, it didn't, it was my third book that I wrote that got me an agent. So you have to, you have to just, Make up your mind that this is the thing that you want. You research it. You look up the ways, whatever the rules are to getting that thing. And then you work. You know, I had to end up with writing the kind of book that an agent would want. Mm -hmm. And then I had to learn how to actually query, where to query, how to query, how to write the query letter. So all of that took some time. And also I started from nothing because I didn't study writing and Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, my background is in art and my profession is in information technology and I'm a designer and a coder and I don't write for for pay. So I had to learn how to do all of that to the point where I didn't even know how to tag dialogue when I first started. I had to learn to do that. So it was all a learning process. And um, when I, when I, finished the first novel, the third novel that got me the, the Asian, I, I knew that it was good. I had a very good feeling about it. Um, but the first, you know, maybe 10 queries I sent out went nowhere. So I pulled back because I didn't want to just like flood and, and, you know, burn my bridges with every single agent there was. Sure. And I, um, I hired an, an editor to take a look at it. Because I figured, you know, I've paid to take so many classes before. And I figured, well, in this case, it's almost like getting a private class if you have sure. a, a good at. And this particular editor was completely worth it because he ran and then sold um, to two independent publishing companies that published mysteries and thrillers. So if anybody knew what sure. makes a good thriller or a mystery it was it was this guy and um he loved it and uh he he knew my agent so he introduced us and that was oh really that's good. great yeah. oh one that's so nice <laughs> so yes. one of, that, it not being even someone that you sent a formal query to he yeah he he helped me out that's yeah. awesome so so that was my my path and then uh and then we went on submission um, before the pandemic. 
mm-hmm. which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it took about a year for anybody because I I'm even I can't believe I sold two books during a pandemic. Yeah, and I, and I think it's worth <laughs> noting for listeners who may not be familiar, once your book is purchased, there's time between that and publication, usually about a year, I would say, right? About between a year, yeah. Purchase and publication. So that's a really pretty great timeline, especially during a pandemic, for sure. Yeah, yeah so, so, that was, so that kept me busy throughout the pandemic between, you know, normal, weird life and the, you know, writing, writing and finishing and editing and, you know, copy editing and all the processes that go through, all of which was a completely new thing. And I wish there was a book called What to Expect When You're, When You've Sold Your Book. Hey, I mean, that's a book you could write. (laughs) (laughs) That's a future book, What to Expect When You're Expecting a Book. (laughs) Yeah, I think there might be blogs like that, but there isn't an actual book that because not, I, I couldn't even understand the words they were throwing at me, you know, mm. because there's there's a, a developmental edit, then there's a, a copy edit, then there's a final edit, then there's something called first pass, then there's something called second pass, and the final pass. And I was like, I don't know what these are. Just tell me. <laughs> tell me what I need to do. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's... um. I find it fascinating because I know with nonfiction books, there's been some complaints about editing process with fact checking. So it used to be on the publisher to fact check and it's not always the case now, depending on, on the press. So I think it's great that fiction is still getting, you know, tight editing like that, where you do have that many passes through because we're all fallible. And I, I mean, I think we've all read a published book where there's a typo. I mean, that's just, it, even with all those eyes, it's, it's very easy for it to happen. So I'm glad to hear that it's still that rigorous. Um, it's 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 fairly it's fairly rigorous yeah and I, I mean i think it depends to uh on the publisher uh so i'm with a an imprint of penguin random house and an imprint is in case your listeners don't know is basically a small publishing house that's been kind of gobbled up by a bigger one and they they sort of it's a weird combination of being independent and not it's kind mm-hmm. of it's kind of like not quite a franchise mm-hmm. because they're still it's still part of Penguin Random House, mm-hmm. um, but they kind of work like an like a, their own unit. That's really interesting because I know it from the reader side, which is that often with imprints, it's a good way to find other books that you like because imprints tend to be genreed. It's one yeah. of the reasons that they don't fully absorb them and give them a different name. It's because like, um, the example that's coming to mind is comic books, which is not ideal, but uh, Vertigo used to be the arm of DC comics that did more adult stuff that did like the R rated comics all went through Vertigo. Um, so if you wanted to read that kind of thing, Sandman, which they just made a, um, a TV series out was a Vertigo, I believe um, publication. And then it tends to be fairly similar as a librarian. That's something I look for is like what the imprint does, because that tends to give me an idea of what the style might be, if not the exact genre. Um, yeah. But I didn't realize it on the other end for the author that it's an experience like that where you're not quite a part of the main shuffle of the press. Yeah. And I found that out when I had to uh, order more books for myself. Mm-hmm. Because uh, if you're if you're with actually Penguin Random House, you get a portal access, and you can like look at your own account and all of that. And if you're with the imprint of Penguin Random House, you don't. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to go, like call and ask somebody nicely to see if they'll send you copies of your own book. You do, you do, and then they kind of they create like a, a, a another account for you that you mm-hmm. can use. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I noticed also that you had a lot of short stories that were published both in like collections and in literary yeah. magazines. That was started, was that 2017 when that kind of so started? I, actually, my first one came out in uh, 2012. Oh. So so what happened was I started taking class. When I, when I became serious about this, I thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing at all. Um, so I took classes, and the classes I took were with uh, Gotham writing mm-hmm. classes which yeah you see them everywhere advertised in, in manhattan that's awesome 
Love it's that. one of the best. Like I recommend them to everyone. They're absolutely the best. I love them. They have the best teachers. Really good format if you're just starting out. I can't recommend them highly enough. Um, and my very first assignment in one of the classes turned into a short story, which I then sold, and I actually won an award for it That's back amazing. in 2012. Yeah, so that gave me a lot of a lot of oomph to go forward and sure. And you start off with a a win like that. Like, how could it not, right? Yeah, yeah. But then I I kind of started got serious. Yeah, I'm going to write novels, but novels take a while. And then it took me a few years to realize well, I could take a break for a month and write a short story, mm-hmm. because then you know it's done and I can submit it, and then I have a lot more chance to be published. And having the short stories. Uh, really actually help it helps so that's awesome sell the books yeah yeah and I saw because I was checking I, I was creeping yeah. around your Amazon profile <laughs> the, before you came out and it looks like you got into some pretty great anthologies as well. well well I'm actually like kind of I just found out that one of the anthologies that's still going gangbusters is uh when a stranger comes to town mm-hmm. um and I think that you know, the New City Library has it or the system yeah. has it. I will say we probably have it, but everything's in storage. <laughs> no, I saw it. I Actually, I looked for it. I, I, oh, is it I, on the shelf? Might, That's great. So someone can come and you, grab it. You right might now. even have it as, a, as an e-book. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the authors in, in it is, is Michael Connelly. Oh, yeah. And, Love Michael Connelly. And this, and this short story he wrote is being turned into a, a series. I, I don't know. I don't wow. remember if I read it. it was a series or a movie, like a matrix, like a team. Oh, wow. But yeah, uh, that story, that anthology is not going to be so. What, That's what, good what, for you because you know people will buy the book. You know, and they yeah, want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the way the way I see it, I'm I'm one degree of separation from Stephen King because there's a Joe Hill story in there, and I got oh. to. Joe Hill I got to meet Joe. Of mine too. Oh yeah, and I got to meet him via Zoom, but I got to meet him and oh, talk to him. What was that like? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's awesome. You know, it was great. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's so what I'm saying. You're an excellent networker. I think. I mean, you really you reached out to me initially last year um, about doing a panel, and you put together just such a great collection of authors. It was such a great discussion. Just as a side note for listeners, that is available on our YouTube channel if you're interested in last year's talk. I believe we recorded it. Um, and, um, it was so great and you were just such a great moderator is, is that networking happened post publication or was that something you were able to get your foot in the door with pre publication? Good question. Um, I think as with everything I was kind of learning as I went along and, and to tell you the truth, I was a little bit in the closet about being an author until I started actually selling because I was like there's so many people who are writing but not but they're in that stage where they haven't quite gotten there and I I felt I felt very self-conscious about being in that space until and I know not everybody does some people are very open about their journey and I just I I couldn't I couldn't be that open about my journey until until I got there I understand completely (laughs) yeah Although, although I have to say one of the, uh, one author who is unbelievably, um, influential and helpful was exactly this kind of person who it took her like 12 years of writing a book a year after having an agent. So she cut an agent and then she still wrote a book a year and she couldn't sell it. And she blogged about it all the time and she had all these other things on her website where she you know helped the writing community and ex- and ha- connected a lot of writers with agents and with editors so a lot of people who became part of her little blogging sphere mm-hmm. found agents found publication before she did oh goodness and eventually she did and she came and but she kind of did it secretly also mm-hmm. but but she had like a persona. Yeah. Once she once she got and got a, sold her books, she outed herself. Um, but she was the one who kind of eventually led me to another agent who blogged, and that agent who blogged led me to the editor 
who led me to my agent. So it was all very interconnected. And I think anybody who wants this, you definitely should. If you, reach out. Even, well, you reach out. And even if you're very shy about yourself, it's very easy to research and be part of a community and even be part of a community incognito if that's what you want, but still be part of it because that's how you learn about who everyone is and what everyone is doing. And it's, and then it just kind of begins to happen. So I think it's, um, it's really great to think about community inspiring each other to success. And also just what you were saying about outlining and doing the research on outlining, we're all people reaching out to help each other is incredibly powerful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the writing community is very small in some ways, but very encouraging, at least in the genre. I, I've heard different things about the literary world. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talk about literary fiction versus genre fiction on this podcast a lot. My um, yeah. former co-host, who is totally fine, she just <laughs> she got another job. Uh-huh. But Dana and I talked about it because Dana's a big literary fiction reader, and I'm a big genre reader. And we both love our chosen books, but have very different experiences even discussing them. And, you know, we talk a lot. We talked pretty extensively about the experience of genre reading versus literary fiction reading and how often literary fiction is genre fiction, but it's been coded otherwise to be more successful publication wise. Um, We talk a lot about magical realism which, you know, it's always an interesting distinction and things like that. And, you know, I think about that a lot, how from a writer's perspective, it must impact you as well. But it doesn't surprise me that genre writers are able to rely on each other that way. It is a smaller community, for one thing, right? I'm not sure if it's a smaller community. Um, I think more genre writers get published than literary (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean they make a, they they make a lot of genre books. Genre readers are very dedicated readers. Certainly, romance sells better than any other kind of book going. I mean, romance readers are voracious. Yeah, and I I after that, sure. and I I'm actually working on a a book right now that's going to be a standalone if it all goes well. Um, and I keep telling myself put more romance, into it. even though it's. You know, it's in my it's in my lane. It's crime. It's a thriller. I just I love it. I love romance, and I think books should have more of it. All books should probably have more of it because it's such an an integral part of the human experience. Um, I can't and, agree more. <laughs> yeah, I think I think there's a weird thing ha- that has happened in American genre um, publishing is that for some reason, and it's it seems to only be American, it's not okay. the case in England or Australia, but a lot of um, the writers in America who write especially mysteries are older, and therefore like the readers are perceived to be older. Mm-hmm. And so romance, I'm not sure if it's because of that or for what reason, has taken slightly a backseat within that genre. Mm-hmm. Maybe I don't know why, but I think it's a mistake because in yeah. in England there's there's younger writers in gen- mm-hmm. writing in this genre, um, and I I'm wondering partly like I've devoted a lot of thinking to this, and I think because um, it's hard it's hard to make a living as a writer, so a lot of writers almost don't- impossible. <laughs> I was I would argue. <laughs> So, so a lot of writers don't, especially in the genre, don't begin until after they're either retired mm-hmm. or at a point in their careers where they can maybe, where they can devote their, you know, extra time mm-hmm. to writing, like where they're not both working a full time job and taking care of little kids. Right, like we were talking about earlier. Unless you're like a Shirley Jackson or a yeah. Stephanie Meyer, who are just really extraordinary, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to have another undertaking in your life. Yeah. In that in that phase, I wonder too if you maybe this maybe I'm off base, but it's just something I've noticed because I, I do read a lot of mystery, and it seems to have changed really significantly over the last ten to fifteen years. But I think there was a perception of mystery as a very male genre a lot of the time. A lot of 
male dominated, not even the authors so much as the main characters. And I wonder if that impacted how romance figured in as well. That's a good, that's a good point. And I, I think there's, so there's mystery, but there's thrillers. So the thrillers Mm -hmm. I think were more male and then there's noir. And noir was definitely more male, but I'm, I'm putting it at, at, at Stephanie Meyer's feet. I think, all these women answered, <laughs> answered yeah. the, right around that same yeah. time. And, and I think so many of us started writing thrillers and mysteries. I wonder, too, if that's because publishers became more open to women-led books because of the success of Twilight, too. Maybe. You know, um, and Hunger Games, which came really on the on the feet of that you know one of the other things themes that comes up a lot in this podcast is we talk a lot about YA literature and the birth of modern YA literature because Mm -hmm. um you know I'm in my late 30s and teen literature as it exists now really didn't exist even when I was a teenager we're not talking that long ago 20 years ago um and I think a preponderance of YA literature would launch a lot of careers just by and younger careers you know is um, I think younger authors have that in their head that there's books written for them in a yeah. way that wouldn't, have been, you know. I I mean I I I find it all very interesting because it's I feel like and also there's themes there's themes that kind of oh, yeah. seem to be the same and float around and I think we're all being we're all thinking the same stuff we're all being influenced by the same stuff and so. You know, even when I read agent blogs, they're going to say there's this weird stuff coming into our inbox. And like mm-hmm. we got five, you know, queries today about, you know, this one like really specific weird theme, you know, and it's, you know, and I think, I think we, you know, we all watch the same Netflix shows, you know, mm-hmm. like the whole country. The, it, it, it's just something that floats around and if, plug into the zeitgeist you, it's going to come out and so for a while you know there's so many novels that were you know called you know moms in trouble which is where i ended up you know <laughs> um and that and the, and i didn't even realize that was a, a a thing until i saw a goodreads list i'm like oh i guess i fit right in there you know they, there mean, was like a whole a, list of, you know i think it's a wonderful thing i think one of the beautiful things about reading in genre is finding really specific tropes that you enjoy because, you know, I was just talking to um, one of the Barlow librarians, Karen Ostertag, who does our Twitter feed. And I said, Oh, you know, Nona the ninth is coming out, which is a very big um, third book in a sci-fi trilogy. It's been very popular. Gideon the ninth was the first one. Tasman Mira is the author and um, happens to be about necromancy. And I was like, you know, what we should tweet is other books about necromancy that you can read while you're waiting for your hold to come in on Known of the Ninth. And it seems like really niche, but I think there's something really beautiful about the fact that there are probably like five to 10 books that someone who's read that would really enjoy. And you know that because it's part of one of these zeitgeisty things. Um, so you know, that just probably. reminded me, there's a, I don't know if you're familiar, but there's a new website that it started maybe a year ago, and it's really gaining popularity. It's called Shepherd Shepherd. Shepherd. It's new to me. And and it's this guy who started it, and he's his goal is to make it a competitor to Goodreads. Ooh, that's which, which is interesting because it's worth noting Goodreads is now owned by Amazon, which maybe not everybody realizes. Yeah. Um, and and his but his whole idea is that Goodreads kind of went down, and a path that Mm -hmm. is not necessarily the best sort of path. And what what he, so he created this website called shepherd.com and the way it works is authors recommend like five books that are similar to their own book. Okay. And then you end up with these lists and the lists could be weirdly specific or kind of generic. But if you, if there's something you're particularly interested in, you put in like sort of whatever it is you're interested in and you end up with these lists. Yeah. And in those lists, you also get, well, if you like this one, you're also going to like those, which is exactly what you're talking about. And he's developing the algorithms to make this work. 
So I'm morally obligated to talk about Novelist when this comes out, um, comes up because Novelist is a database the library has ownership of. Not we don't own it. We have a seat on. Um, and so if that sounds appealing to you, but you want something that's been vetted in a different way, Novelist does read alike lists um, that are really pretty specific. And you, if you like an author, particularly, it'll list like every author who like writes similarly to them. Um, and if you have a new city library card, you can use it for free. Just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> That's great. That's great. And we even have a K through 12 version of Novelist. So there's like one for adults and one for, for kids, although you can access all the kids information through the adult one. But if you have a student and you want to just direct them to stuff that might be on reading level for them, that's something to take a look at. Um, but I think the more the merrier when it comes to read-alike sites, because there is so much being published now. It's so overwhelming to figure out what you want to read. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's a great thing. It's a, it's an embarrassment of riches. Of course, it makes it hard for authors, I imagine. Um you know, to stand on the shoulders of giants and shout as loud as you can. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting place. But like I said, I firmly believe that if you give yourself a goal, you'll get there. I mean, it's hard to argue with you. You did it. It's um, pretty apparent that you really manifested that for yourself in a really beautiful way. Um do you think you'll continue that that series that you have two books in, or is that kind of a complete? It's thing? kind of complete for now. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm working on next is uh, very exciting for me. And I just hope that uh, I hope that once again I will have plugged into some kind of zeitgeist and it will do okay. Um, but that's 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 like a, a voodoo part of the writing. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of that you don't know until you know, right? Yeah. Um, before we go, I was just curious if you wouldn't mind giving us a thumbnail idea of what the first book in your series is about, because this is an opportunity for you to, to tell us about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So the the first book is about um, an undercover NYPD detective, a woman who um, leaves the force after a racketeering case against the Russian mob. Um, and after the case kind of goes belly up and explodes in her face and then her personal life explodes in her face and she's left as a single parent of a, you know, basically a troubled child. Um, and she moves up to here, basically where, where we live. Um, I wrote about a town called Sylvan, but mm -hmm. it's really a new city. Oh, I love that. I don't think I realized that. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I put her into a house, you know, similar to my house. Um, and all, every time I write about it, I just imagine like the street outside. And, just, uh, and so she manages to live this kind of half life until for three years and she thinks everything's all right. And then her kid disappears. Mm -hmm. And so then she needs to figure out it's on her you know did her son run away which is what most people think because he was such an oddball or is it the you know the ghosts of her past life and her you know past as a as a detective and as an undercover and as all the things she did or failed to do is all of that coming back to haunt her and that's the first book I love that. What a great pitch. I want to go out and read it right now. And I, when I was looking at Amazon, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have a very specific inspiration for that character, right? Oh, yeah. Right. So the character is really my husband, who was an undercover NYPD detective. Um, and uh, he spent so many years coming home and telling me his stories about being an undercover and buying drugs and all the people he met and all the ways that he bought drugs and all just the craziness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, first we, we, we used to say, well, he'll write his memoirs, but of course he's not a writer. So then I, I said, okay, I'll write your memoirs, but I don't want to write his story. So then I'm like, all right, you're getting a sex change <laughs> and uh, you're going to be a character in my novel. And that's, and he was like, sure, fine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very helpful with uh, getting all the details right. And, of course, I get some of them wrong. And we listen to the audio book. And he's like, mm, I wish you'd ask me about that one. And I'm like, well, I, 
I am sure about a lot of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. Yeah, that's how that went. I mean, that's tremendous. You can't ask for a better muse, especially yeah. one that you can continue to consult as a specialist in your own home. I know, but you know, what's weird. He retired. He's been retired for seven years now, and. Mm-hmm. Much like everything else, policing is so different. Sure. That if I do write about it, I kind of have to get a new a new source or set it in the past. You yeah, know? and it's it, I guess not past enough to be retro yet, right? It's not like it was thirty years ago where you could have a fun period piece just yet. <laughs> Except that's what I'm doing my standalone. Uh, oh, that's wonderful! I, I decided I just. I really wanted to write about New York in the late 80s when Gentry. Well, that's, I would say that's late 80s is definitely far back enough to be. That's far back enough. So, yeah. so that's the new, that's the new one. And I'm, uh, it's just, I love, I love working on it. It's, oh, the city in the 80s is a fascinating time and place. I can't wait to see what you do with that. And I hope yeah. that um, writes easy for you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've got that. Uh, because you figure at the time, it was just when the city was just beginning to gentrify and there were mm-hmm. all the squatters and the Tompkins Square Park riots. So that's all in there. Times Square was a totally different place. I remember being a really young kid with my parents. It was a whole other thing. I, I laugh now when I walk through there with my child. It's such a um, disney version of what I grew up with. <laughs> and well, for better or for worse, it's just totally different. So this is another interesting thing, you know, how I said, like, we all watch the same, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of the authors in the, in, in the industry end up going in like schools of fish, we can and get affected by the same stuff. And I'm not the only one who's like writing right now about that time period. And I think it's just something that's happening. I, don't I wonder, too, if that's almost like um, how clothing styles will come back in 20 year yeah. increments like it's far enough back now that it's not immediate you can have time to like reflect on that time yeah. mm-hmm. I feel like the 80s would have just kind of come into that it's long ago enough now that we have a lot of perspective yeah you know? yeah um yeah which is frightening that means the 90s are next I have to prepare myself <laughs> well I mean even if this does well then my next one will be the 90s <laughs> I love that one for every decade let's do exactly. it <laughs> yeah well, thank you so much. Is there any like last thoughts that you wanted to share? Anything we didn't get to that you wanted to talk about? I don't want to. No, you know. no. I think uh, except that like I the library. I just have to put it out there. The library saves my life on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. I appreciate I appreciate everything you do. I appreciate that you exist. You know, if I can't sleep, I download something on Hoopla. It helps me. <laughs> you know, it's like it's the best. So oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, if you haven't used uh, Hoopla, highly recommend. It's an alternative to Overdrive. We have both. Hoopla yeah. has different stuff though. It has a lot of audiobooks, a lot of graphic novels. If you're into that, a lot of streaming, yeah. there's TV and movies on there. So yeah. you know, we're trying our we're trying our best to keep everybody uh, buoyed up through all of this nonsense that we're all living through. Yeah, no, it's um, the best. It's like I I I get more excited when I see my books on a library shelf than on a bookstore. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Thank you. It's so <laughs> and, uh, Yeah. No, it's, I, it's, yeah. So I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thanks so much for listening. And I'll just tell you, as always, read on. <laughs>